Welcome back to LDR 655, Seattle Heights University Graduate College. Negotiations is process. We're talking about uh, Chapter 11 in this week in our tax from Lewicki, Saunders, and uh, Barry, cross-cultural negotiation. And I'm going to pull some things outside of the textbook into uh, our discussion here. This graph gives us the four basic layers of diversity. This comes from Garden Schwartz and Rowe back in 1994, diverse teams that were capitalizing on the power of diversity from McGraw-Hill. This model helps us think about diversity in layers, some of which we control and others we don't. At the center of what makes us different from others is the fiber of our personalities. Although two people can have similar personality characteristics, it would be tough, if not impossible, to find two with the exact same personality. Next, we have internal dimensions of diversity that we're not able to change, age, race, gender, so forth. The next layer, external or secondary dimensions of diversity, include personal characteristics that contain an element of control or choice, and they can be changed. For example, under the category of personal habits, an individual can be characterized as a night owl, but can still choose to get up early. Under the religion category, Jews can choose to convert to Christianity, and Christians can choose to convert to Judaism or Islam or Buddhism. The outside layer, organizational dimensions, includes areas that change over the course of one's career. Some are defined by the organization. Some have an element of choice within them. Our ability to understand, value, and manage diversity at all four levels helps us to recognize the unique contributions, potential, of everybody participating. Are you ready to compete in a global diverse market? The U.S. has been losing ground on having the most educated workforce. Globally, we've gone from having a 30% college-educated population 30 years ago to just 14% now. Why do you think that is? Well, this graph comes from the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. This is a partial chart of the 2009 results. Here shows where the U.S. falls on a global comparison. That full chart is much deeper, containing 75 countries. And in math, we barely make it to the top half, or 30th. International negotiations are much more complex, of course, than domestic negotiations. They challenge the negotiators to understand the science of negotiation while developing their artistry as well. Science of negotiation provides research evidence to support broad trends that often, but not always, occur during negotiation. The art of negotiation is deciding which strategy to apply when and choosing which models and perspectives to apply to increase cross-cultural understanding. Two overall contexts have influence on international negotiations. The environmental context, which includes environmental forces that neither negotiator controls, but that will influence the negotiation. And the immediate context, which includes factors which negotiators appear to have some control. Notice the word is appear. Within our context on this graph, factors that make international negotiations more challenging than domestic negotiations include Political and legal pluralism. There are different laws in different countries. International economics, let alone the monetary exchange rates. Foreign governments and bureaucracies. Instabilities in different parts of the world. Different ideologies and cultures and the external stakeholders. All different, depending on, in some cases you can break it down to regions, but entirely different country to country. The immediate context, factors over which the negotiators have some influence and control, include the relative bargaining power, the levels of conflict that you will initiate or tolerate, the relationship between the negotiators, the desired outcomes which you want to be shared, and the immediate stakeholders. International negotiations can be much more complicated, of course. Simple arguments can't explain conflicting international negotiation outcomes. The challenge for us is to understand the multiple influences of several factors on the negotiation process. We want to update this understanding regularly as circumstances change. That's one of the reasons the more diverse our experience with other cultures, the more knowledge we gain, the better off we'll be. We uh, look through the concepts again in, in discussing international negotiations. Culture as a learned behavior. Again, hopefully you've had culture and organizational culture as a discussion in a class previously, but there's a catalog of behaviors that the foreign negotiator should expect. There is culture as shared values, understanding the central norms and values of that particular region that you're going into, and four key areas in particular, individualism, collectivism, power distance, 
career success and quality of life, and uncertainty avoidance. Geert Hofstede in 1991, sees culture is the collective programming of the mind which distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another. He proposes four layers, culture being like an onion that can be peeled layer by layer. The figure on the right shows how Hofstede illustrates the differences between personality, culture, and human nature. There's a link on here. If you download the PDF, you can go right to the website. Human nature is universal, somewhat inherited. Culture is specific to a group or category and is learned, and personality is specific to the individual and partially inherited and learned. And actually, since the textbook was published, Hofstede, if you go out to his website, has updated it to include five areas now. The Power Distance Index focuses on the degree of equality or inequality between people in a country's society. The Individualism, IDV, focuses on the degree the society reinforces individual or collective achievement and interpersonal relationships. The masculinity focuses on the degree the society reinforces or does not reinforce the traditional masculine work role model of male achievement, control, and power. The uncertainty avoidance index, risk, focuses on the level of tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity within the society. These dimensions are measured on a scale of 0 to 100, including 75 countries or regions. Scores are determined by high or low rankings within each category, and again, if you download the PDF there is a uh, or the PowerPoint, there's a link right here that will take you to it. You could also just search it and find his website. It's not that hard to find. It was in the mid-1970s that Dutch academic G- Geert Hofstede based his five dimensions of culture on an extensive survey at IBM, which he investigated the influence of national culture. His methodology was both unique in size as well as structure, and he defined organizational culture as, a, as an idea system that is largely shared between organizational members. By filtering out IBM's dominant corporate culture from his data on IBM's national subsidiaries, Ofsted was able to statistically distinguish cultural differences between countries. We've already discussed them. Power distance, uncertainty avoidance, individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, and time orientation. In individualism and collectivism, just to look at it a little more closer, the definition would be the extent to which society is organized around individuals or around the group. Quite different, for instance, in Japan than it is here in the United States. Individualism, collectivism orientation influences a broad range of negotiation processes, outcomes, and preferences. Individualistic societies may be more likely to swap negotiators using whatever short-term criteria seems important to them at the moment. Collectivistic societies focus on relationships and will stay with the same negotiator for years. In our power distance segment, the extent to which the less powerful members of organizations and institutions, even the family, accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. The fundamental issue here is how a society handles inequalities among people. People in societies exhibiting a large degree of power distance accept a hierarchical order in society in which Everybody has a place and needs no further justification. In societies with low power distance, people strive to equalize the distribution of power and demand justice for inequalities of power. Cultures with stronger power distance will be more likely to have decision-making concentrated at the top of the culture. The career success quality of life segment. The masculinity side is another way of referring to it of this dimension, represents a, a preference in society for achievement heroism, assertiveness, and material reward, again, success, work. Society at large is more competitive in that way. Its opposite, femininity, here represented by life, stands for a preference for cooperation, modesty, caring for the weak, and the quality of life. Society at large is more consensus-oriented. Cultures promoting career success are characterized by the acquisition of money and things and could care less about other people, Cultures promoting quality of life are characterized by concern for relationships and nurturing. So while in your text it talks about work life or career success, quality of life, you actually go out to Hofstede's site. He's going to talk about masculine and feminine. The uncertainty avoidance, low risk, high risk. This dimension expresses the degree to which the members of a society feel uncomfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. The fundamental issue here is how a society deals with the fact that the future can never be known Should we try to control a future or just let it happen? 
Countries exhibiting strong UAI maintain rigid codes of belief and behavior and are more intolerant of unorthodox behavior and new ideas. Weak UIA societies maintain a more relaxed attitude in which practice counts more than principle. Negotiators from high uncertainty avoidance cultures are less comfortable with ambiguous situations and they want more certainty and a lot more detail. Long-term orientation dimension can be interpreted as dealing with society's search for virtue. Societies with a short-term orientation generally have a strong concern with establishing the absolute truth. They are normative in their thinking. They exhibit great respect for traditions, a relatively small propensity to save for the future, and a focus on achieving quick results. In societies with a long-term orientation, people believe that truth depends very much on the situation, the context, and the time. They show an ability to adapt traditions to changing conditions, a strong propensity to save and invest, thriftiness, and perseverance in achieving results. Another measure that Hofstede has started to separate cultures from and the differences between cultures and countries, indulgence versus restraint. Indulgence stands for a society that allows relatively free gratification of basic and natural human drives related to enjoying life and having fun. Want the dessert with the high calories? Restraint stands for a society that suppresses gratification of needs and regulates it by a means of strict social norms. And this table, you see Hofstede's top 10 in individualism. It's the United States. Power distance, the most important, the highest ranking is Malaysia. Assertiveness, it's Sweden. And uncertainty avoidance would be Greece, which is a little odd considering their economic circumstances at the moment. This chart, which I found on the web, and again, uh, it comes from uh, by one, uh, cultures and number clustering, cultures can be based on their scores. And this graph, although not created by Hofstede, is based on Hofstede's data, shows you that there are some regions of the country that have similarities together. Culture is a dialectic. All cultures contain dimensions or tensions that are called dialectics. For example, the Judeo-Christian parable of too many cooks spoils the broth and two heads are better than one, offer conflicting guidance. There's too many cooks, and it's going to spoil the meal, or two working together will achieve a better outcome. That explains some variations within cultures. No human behavior is determined by a single clause, according to some research. All behavior may be understood at many different levels simultaneously. Swartz's 10 different cultural values here are shown within the graph. In the self-transcendence area, you've got universalism and benevolence. In the conservation area, you've got conformity, tradition, and security. In the self-enhancement area, achievement, power, which slides over into hedonism and simulation. The openness to change includes, again, simulation and self-direction. It's a continuing circle, and we do not always fit in one category or another, of course. From a managerial perspective, the definition of negotiation varies greatly among cultures. Negotiation opportunities vary greatly in terms of distributive or integrative. Selection of negotiators varies because what is appropriate to the skill sets, hierarchy, and relationship varies among cultures. Different cultures place different values on the formality of negotiations or the protocol, the process of which you will follow. Communication is different, both verbally and non-verbally. It is not the same in every culture. Time sensitivity varies greatly, particularly the difference in starting and ending times, the pace of negotiations, and whether one values event time versus clock time. Risk propensity, as some are more risk-adverse than others, is another area that's different. Again, the group versus individual emphasis. The nature of the agreements. Memorandums of understanding, for example, signal a beginning for some of the negotiation process, while it would be an ending of the process for others. That's an agreement. Emotionalism varies by culture, and you need to understand to which level emotionalism is appropriate or part of a show in the negotiation process. You don't want to be too emotional if it will cause major problems in the negotiation because it's unacceptable behavior in a different culture. When choosing strategies, Negotiators should be aware of both their own and the other party's culture in general. What things are normally done. Understand the specific factors in the current relationship. Try to predict or try to influence the other party's approach. 
and strategies are arranged based on the level of familiarity, low, moderate, and high, that a negotiator has with the other party's culture. If you have low familiarity, you employ agents or advisors, a unilateral strategy useful for negotiators who have little awareness of the other party's culture. You can bring in a mediator, a joint strategy. It encourages one side or the other to adopt one culture's approaches or to mediate the culture approach. You can try and induce the other party to use your approach, again, a joint strategy, but the other party may become irritated or insulted. If you have moderate familiarity with the other culture, you can adapt to the other negotiator's approach. That's, again, a unilateral strategy, which involves making consensus changes to your approach so it is more appealing to the other party. You can do a coordinate adjustment, a joint strategy that involves both parties making some mutual adjustments to find a common process for negotiation. If you have high familiarity, and I think we have to assume that they have high familiarity with your culture as well, you can embrace the other negotiator's approach, again, that unilateral strategy, adopting completely the approach of the other negotiator. Negotiator needs to be completely bilingual and bicultural, though. This is not amateur time. You can improvise an approach, a joint strategy, craft an approach that is specifically tailored to the negotiation situation, the other party and the circumstances. Or another joint strategy would be the effect symphony. The parties create a new approach that may include aspects of either home culture or adopt practices from a third culture. There's our look at cultural diversity for our final online class. If you have any questions or need to contact me, please do so. I will take care of you within 24 hours. In general, you have a great week. We'll see you next week in class.